Thank you all. It's uh, great to have uh, uh, the second speaker of today's colloquium. Uh, Christopher Green from Syracuse University uh, is an assistant professor of linguistics there. Uh, he specializes in prosodic phonology, the phonology, morphology interface, and field linguistics. Uh, he has worked primarily on African languages, uh, and many of them, including but not limited to Mande, Cushitic, Dogon, Jarawan, and um, uh, couple of uh, languages from the Bantu families. And um, uh, he, his reference grammar of Somali just came out recently, so please check it out. <laughs> and he has written numerous articles on topics such as syllable structure, prosodic structure, uh, tone, and wordhood. I think, uh, uh, and I think we talk about it, like we are, I met Chris uh, at one of the annual conference on African linguistics uh, a long time ago uh, that was held in Georgia. And uh, I think uh, since then he has been working on various issues that basically pushed us, our thinking uh, in terms of how we can think about uh, wordhood uh, and in, uh, in the interface uh, between phonology and morphology. It's very, it's great to have you here at IC Link, and today he will talk about theory feeds description, feeds theory, <laughs> a case study of Somali Moraic phonology. Great, thank you. Let me um, share my screen. Let's see if this works. All right. It works. So yeah. yeah. All right, wonderful. Thank you. So um, thanks so much for the invitation to uh, speak with you today and. To tell you a little bit about my ongoing research um, on prosodic structure in African languages, um, the inspiration for this talk um, stems oh, Chris, from an exchange Chris, that. Yes. Chris, uh, do you mind making it a little bit uh, wider uh, on the side? Oh, yeah. So it's easier. Of to, yeah. How's that? Just one step. Yeah. That yes, good? that's great. Okay. Sorry, sorry for cutting you off. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, what was I saying? Okay, the uh, yeah, the inspiration for this talk um, uh, stemmed from an exchange that I saw on social media not too long ago, where a colleague who has worked for well over a decade on a group of endangered languages wondered um, out loud, so to speak, um, in a series of posts about whether or not it would be worthwhile uh, for one's career to begin uh, a large description project, uh, namely uh, to write a reference grammar for one of these languages that where, where one didn't exist, um, rather than continuing uh, to focus on advancing uh, an explicitly theory-driven research program. And so in reading the uh, comments that followed, um, I uh, both pro and con, um, I was reminded of a series of papers by Larry Hyman that I list here for you on 2003 and 2004, where uh, Larry uh, uh, centered on the relationship between uh, linguistic theory and language description. And he argued among other things that while theory is a guide to linguistic discovery, the outcomes of that discovery or the description itself in turn provides a lot of data and insights for further advancing theory, so feeding forward. So in short, what uh, Hyman is arguing is that language description and theorization go hand in hand and really can't be separated from one another. And so as a field linguist and as a phonologist, this uh, methodological cycle um, drives and really stands at the core of my own research agenda. And uh, it's one that has been fully realized uh, while recently working on my Somali reference grammar that Professor Lee just mentioned. Um, today, I hope to demonstrate uh, its utility with a case study of uh, Somali uh, Moraic phonology. So in this talk, what I'm going to do is to tackle conflicting views on the role played by the Mora in Somali. Um, and I address these conflicts in light of cross-linguistic evidence for so-called Moraic mismatches and their admission into Moraic theory. Um, I show that a detailed description of Somali's phonotactics and the language of syllables uh, shape distribution reveal a key role played by moras of different types. Uh, more specifically, I'm going to show that consonantal moras seem to play a role in segmental phenomena, where tonal phenomena instead appear to reference only vocalic moras. Um, these findings present a challenge to uh, Hyman's 1992 Moraic uniqueness hypothesis that says at any given stage in a derivation, there should be only one Moraic projection. Well, what does this mean? Um, it essentially means that all processes in a language that reference weight or quantity should count moras in the same way. Or yet another way to look at this is essentially if you're going to count 
consonantal morphs at all in a language, you should do so for all processes. So we, we'll talk a little bit about this, this challenge, this Moraic uniqueness hypothesis, but also these findings um, support um, a process-based uh, based approach to syllable weight as argued for um, in Gordon 2004. And Somali actually does uh, this in quite a, a well-behaved way. Um, the uh, findings here for Somali also inform arguments for a so-called composite model of geminate representation that has figured into a uh, debate between Baker and Davis over a, a few years. And then, of course, there are, uh, as you might expect, there are some descriptive insights that this offers uh, elsewhere in the language, particularly uh, in long debated patterns of vowel zero alternations that occur in the language. Okay, so a little bit of background here. The mora is a well established as Somali's tone bearing unit um, in classic works by Hyman, Biber, and Bonte uh, back in the 80s. And to give you just an example of uh, what this looks like here, words of different shapes and sizes show high tone assigned to the penultimate, final, or only mora of a content word. So here in one, I show you uh, the in one A through E, we have the uh, penult cases uh, with the exception of one E that's monosyllabic, uh, one F through J, these are the final cases, again, with one J being the exception in that it's monosyllabic. The separation here is because um, we have um, masculine grammatical gender words are the first group, one A through E, and then uh, feminine grammatical gender, uh, F through J. So there is a correlation uh, that is, is well known between the location of high tone and the grammatical gender. So just looking at this uh, distribution alone, it might seem reasonable to assume that um, coded consonants aren't moraic. They seem not to be counted in calculating the location of high tone assignments. And this has actually been the general consensus in the literature. Um, in John Said's 1999 reference grammar, which is essentially uh, you know, the, the one that everyone references, uh, he says that more is attached to vowels, the number of consonants in a syllable does not affect the counting of moras, and only vowel melodies are relevant for counting. But there's really reason to call this into question, and this, that's what um, uh, Martin Orwin and his colleagues did. Um, uh, a little while uh, around that same time. Um, Orwin says that um, coded constants may be Moraic quote unquote early, which would be in line with uh, Larry Hyman's uh, take on, uh, on, on moras. However, they lose their mora prior to high tone assignment. So a little bit more specifically here, Orwin talks about the fact that CBC syllables are heavy up to a certain derivational stage, followed by which they are light. Um, he later, along with his colleague Garye, uh, talk about the fact that CVC syllables appear to be banned from some poetic scansion positions, so in poetic metrics. So they talk about the fact that syllable final codes do seem to count, which leads them to consider whether CVC must now be regarded as heavy rather than light, and that do is my emphasis. So we've got some conflicting points of view here. So one of the things that I was very curious about is whether or not there were any other phenomena in Somali that appear to reference the mora. And if there are, do they implicate a, a moraic or non-moraic status of coded consonants? And uh, you know, further questions that, that come about in this, the literature that I mentioned about particular processes. Do particular processes count uh, mores of different types? And essentially, what, what can this tell us uh, big picture? Well, to cut to the chase, uh, yes, there are indeed other phenomena in Somali that appear to reference the Mora. And today I'm going to focus on word shape and minimality requirements, as well as constraints on syllable shape distribution. And both of these, I'm going to argue, suggest coda moraicity, and they also provide some insight into V0 alternations, which if we have time, I can, I can uh, talk about a bit. All right, so starting with word shape and minimality, uh, the smallest content words in Somali are BC, CBC, and in a few instances we have uh, shapes that involve glides, which I've listed here as uh, a capital Y, so vowel glide, C vowel glide. Um, this vowel glide uh, represents uh, one of five diphthongs. I should know, uh, for those of you who might be familiar with Somali, uh, that long diphthongs uh, occur 
occur in the Somali orthography, but they are well known to not be contrastive. They are um, associated with borrowings, uh, morphologically complex words where there's coalescence involved, and they're also uh, variants listed of short um, vowel glide sequences. Okay, so just a few different examples here in two to show you that words of uh, different shapes involving different vowels, different diphthongs um, are, are found, and they are contentful uh, words. There's a couple exceptions to this, though, that I list in three, uh, only three that I'm aware of, and I've, I've scanned some dictionaries, C, who, and U. Um, C is um, perhaps a little bit funny. It takes us a regular plural, um, but who and E, it's uh, unclear. E is involved. It's a, it's a word for a stream or a bray of an animal, like a donkey. Um, Moving on from these uh, word shapes, most uh, identical vowel, long vowel um, sequences and CVV uh, shapes, as opposed to CV glide, are associated with function words and interjections. So here I list for you most of the ones that I am aware of, uh, subordinators, a focus marker, some interjections, um, so on and so forth. So um, uh, mostly function words. There are uh, two content words that I'm aware of that fit into this category. Um, Moving on to yet other shapes, we have um, CV uh, shaped items, and these tend to be function words or clitics. Um, interestingly, words in this category do not bear tone or at least don't bear tone consistently. And of course, there's those exceptions I, I mentioned in, in three. Um, I, I mentioned here the connection to tone because there has been uh, arguments by um, some other folks that, um, that uh, high tone and, and, and wordhood correlate with one another. Um, also in this group, we have the four adpositions in the language that also exhibit clitic-like behavior, but sometimes form compounds that when they get big enough, they start to behave like words. So if we look at these shapes and their behavior so far, this might suggest a minimality condition of sorts. Um, this, of course, uh, would be um, if we count both vocalic and consonantal moras, we would say that there is a bimeraic minimum in the language. But then we you know, want to uh, ask ourselves about things like this uh, distribution of CVV versus CV glide. And so the difference there might reveal a preference for perhaps a word final falling sonority rhyme, non identical gestural slots, or perhaps um, some kind of preference for a CVC where we actually have a, um, a vocalic and consonantal mora. But I'm just throwing that out there. So, uh, we need to keep looking, right? We need to find out. Uh, this doesn't. We don't know very much yet about the shape or about the function of um, coded consonants. Um, so there are uh, uh, plenty of other word shapes. We have plenty of VVC and CVVC words um, where we have these identical vowel vowel sequences, and these are much more abundant. So a bunch of different uh, examples for you here in seven, and I think I've covered all of the different vowels in the language. Uh, something I'll, I'll mention is that uh, it looks like Somali's got five vowels. It's got this long, short contrast. There's also an ATR contrast in the language um, that doesn't seem to play into this at all. The, the, the uh, tense versus lax vowels essentially pattern the same way as, as others, but um, just to make you aware of that. Okay, moving on, uh, we can see that there are many um, vowel glide C and C vowel glide C word shapes, um, though there are some restrictions on which consonants can appear a uh, word finally after a diphthong. There seem to be a uh, fewer uh, that involve uh, wa here in 8a through d, and there's uh, plenty more that, uh, that involve ya, uh, but this list uh, is not exhaustive, just to kind of give you uh, representative um, examples here. So with these words, um, we could say that these would uh, satisfy minimality, but they don't necessarily tell us all that much about the Moraic status of final consonants. There are several possibilities. It could be that the, the consonants are simply non moraic It could be that these final consonants are Moraic, but perhaps they are somehow extra metrical or extra syllabic. Uh, different, um, different proposals are out there for how to treat these types of um, consonants in, in other related languages. Or perhaps it's the case that they're simply super heavy. We also have geminates to contend with. Um, Somali has contrastive geminate stops, um, four of them, in fact, uh, as well as four uh, contrastive uh, sonorants that are geminates. And so I'm giving you some pairs here that are pretty, yeah, pretty close minimal pairs here. Um, 
uh, between the uh, geminates uh, here on the left and the singleton on the right. Um, these end up being important to us because um, there are actually stem final geminates arguably in the language, and these are realized long whenever possible, yet they're shortened word finally. So here's uh, an example I have for uh, the verb uh, ab to drink. So in the imperative form, we see it uh, on its own, the, the geminate is shortened. But here in uh, the first person singular and third person uh, masculine singular, we see that the geminate is able to be realized. Uh, the argument is that there's this empty agreement slot here that I've listed over here on, on the right. Um, however, when it comes to the second person singular or the third person feminine singular, uh, that empty spot uh, that was in the, the first and third masculine is filled by uh, this ta, and so the gemini is, sh uh, is shortened. So this is important because in these instances, we see that that gemini, um, a part of that gemini shows up in the coda. So that's, that's uh, gonna be important going forward. So, Thus far, uh, you know, we see some evidence perhaps for um, a minimality condition if we look at, um, uh, you know, content words versus function words, interjections, so on and so forth. But um, what's going to be more important is uh, the, the status of that final uh, consonant and coda consonants in general. And in order to, uh, to think more about that, we're gonna have to look um, at um, syllable shape distribution uh, uh, elsewhere in words. So we'll turn to that next. Um, these restrictions on word internal syllable shape distribution actually do tell um, a much more interesting story. Um, so to start with the basics, uh, CVV and CVC syllables are found word internally before another onset. So tons of different examples here in 10 showing all different uh, combinations. Uh, we have nasals and liquids and sops. Um, we also have uh, fricatives down here. So not, not too terribly restricted. Um, so there's your CVCs, and then we have CVVs. So um, thus far, the distribution of these word internal CVCs and CVBs is inconclusive, right? Whether the, the consonants and CVCs are Maraic or not, it's fine uh, alongside uh, those CVVs. Um, as I said, if codas are Maraic, we would expect CVC to be uh, well accommodated in that same location as, as um, those uh, syllables with long uh, vowels. Um, word internal CV geminate syllables, so closed by a geminate, um, are also possible, where this geminate is presumably shared across the syllable boundary. So um, lots of examples of these. I've just given you a handful uh, here in 12 showing different possibilities. Um, Important to keep in mind here is that most approaches to gemination assume uh, underlying moriacity. Um, and so if a CV geminate uh, type of syllable is accommodated word internally under the same distribution as CVV and as we've just seen CVC, um, this isn't all that telling either, right? We've, it's, it, there's a more there, we expect the more to be there. But here's where things get really interesting. Uh, CVBC and CVB uh, geminate syllables, their word internal distribution is markedly different from one another. And, and importantly, CVBC syllables are strikingly absent word internally. So that's a surprise. Um, on the other hand, an even bigger surprise is that CVB geminate syllables are permitted in this same distribution. We see here in 13 a bunch of different options. I'm going to take a sip really quick of my water. So this is where uh, things uh, really uh, need some explanation here. Um, so what can explain this type of skewed distribution? Um, if anything, we might actually expect the opposite distribution, given that geminates are presumably inherently moraic. Um, even if codas are not moraic, this distribution is odd, right? Somali doesn't otherwise have a type of coda condition. The third possibility, if both codas and geminates are Maraic, this definitely raises a question as to why these uh, CVVC with a singleton would be in a different distribution as those uh, with uh, a geminate. So in order to think about this a little uh, more, uh, this isn't anything that has figured into the literature. I don't think it's been described before. Um, in order to figure out what this all means, we need to think a little bit about geminate behavior and representation. And so for a baseline, uh, consider the distribution of those CVVCs. 
As we've seen, they are permitted word finally, perhaps due to extra metricality or extra syllabicity. Um, and this would actually align with other Afroasiatic languages. And there's a really uh, fantastic um, um, cross linguistic, or excuse me, cross dialectal summary of Arabic uh, done by Watson in 2007 that kind of entertains both these possibilities. Um, but in, in the case of these word internal uh, syllables, extra metricality is, is not going to be an option, right? Um, so if it's the case that code is armoraic, but extra metricality is not an option word internally, this might um, uh, get us somewhere in explaining the absence of these internal uh, CBBC shapes. But then again, we still haven't addressed why we would have geminates allowed word internally and not those singletons. And so this is uh, something that is actually quite unusual, but uh, it is reminiscent of work that has been done by Baker on Gala Khan, among a, a few other languages. Uh, what Baker shows is that uh, CV geminate syllables in Gala Khan pattern light, despite other apparently closed syllables patterning as heavy. So for example, in Gala Khan, geminates don't attract stress, but other closed syllables do. Um, uh, Baker accounts for this by proposing that uh, Ngalakan geminates are monogestural segments that are associated with two timing slots, and they pattern in some ways with other singletons. That is, that they, they're, they're able to maintain their length, but they don't attract stress. And so he gets around this, uh, their, their patterning by arguing that they're syllabified into an onset. And in, in that position, they don't uh, figure into a weight calculation. And so he leaves it open as to whether or not they're actually moraic or not, because again, in an onset, they, they, uh, there would be a constraint in the language, uh, unlike some others, uh, where the, the, the more wouldn't be uh, calculated or counted towards weight in the onset. Um, the argument that, that Baker makes is that Galakhan stress requires reference to the gestural tier rather than to timing positions or to mores. Well, this is revisited in work by Davis, uh, 2011 uh, chapter on uh, Geminids. Uh, and he uh, says that, you know, in the interest of a universal treatment of Geminids as Moraic, uh, there's the possibility of a composite model of Geminid structure. And this has been debated between uh, Baker and Davis. Um, what the proposal is here is that uh, the uh, geminate repre uh, geminates are represented uh, by a model that separates timing and gesture, but perhaps also quantity. So Davis's argument is that a geminate is represented on both a timing or length tier and a gestural tier and can be viewed as having a moraic representation if it functions as heavy. And that's my emphasis again there. So what would this look like? For Galakhan, something like this, where uh, uh, there would be a single gesture two timing slots, and then we would have uh, Mora here associated with that geminate, but it wouldn't be counted in the onset. What uh, there, there are predictions, though, of this model in that uh, Davis argues that if Galakhan um, references gestures uh, in its geminates, the model would predict that uh, languages may reference or count other components of the structure. And, and Davis argues that this is actually the case. Um, for example, he talks about languages like Hungarian, whose geminates pattern like other uh, CC sequences concerning their ability to trigger vowel apenthesis. Um, uh, so uh, this is in reference to timing slots. And, but here again, uh, whether or not they involve Morris is unclear. On the other hand, we have languages like Truckees, where geminates uh, necessarily must reference the mora, but they may or may not surface as long, so there may not be a connection to timing slots. So it seems like all three different possibilities are there. Um, so how might this help us un to understand Somali's behavior? Well, as we've seen, uh, geminates in uh, CV uh, geminate or CVC uh, uh, words internally um, are, are possible. Um, we have also seen that when a geminate is shortened, uh, the gesture is resident in the coda. So with this information, there's really no reason to assume a totosyllabic uh, analysis uh, in the sphere of Baker's analysis of Ngala Khan. So I would argue that our default assumption uh, should be that geminates in these word internal CBB geminate syllables are also ambisyllabic, but perhaps it's the case that they somehow lose their more. And what would that look like? 
So if we uh, appeal to this composite model, it might be possible for these word internal gemmets to vacate their mora, but maintain their gesture and length due to licensing by the following syllable. And that's uh, the uh, representation that I, I'm, I'm throwing up here. Um, the, this can be compared though to word internal CVVCs. Um, because no such licensing is possible in those types of syllables, perhaps their fate is different, and that's why we don't uh, see them arising in the language. So from the big picture perspective, uh, we could say that Somali phonotactic constraints are sensitive to moras rather than to gestural time or, uh, gestural slots or timing slots. Um, Interestingly, though, uh, uh, totally independently, uh, work by Sabrina Benjabala and David Legak in 2019 have argued that timing slots are necessary to explain uh, sensitivity of Somali's singleton versus geminate consonants to lenition. But then, then again, they don't um, consider the case of moriosity. So if we take the two perspectives together, it would appear that perhaps when it comes to Somali geminates, both moras and timing slots have a role to play in the language and uh, it, it would help to explain uh, geminate behavior. And uh, this could be fairly strong support uh, in favor of this composite model of geminate structure that's been proposed. So uh, with that said, I mean, there's uh, uh, some important implications here. Um, Word shape and syllable shape distribution, I would argue, um, seem to implicate quota moriosity um, on the surface in Somali and arguably um, underlyingly. Um, recall uh, the study that I mentioned by Martin Orwin above, um, and I've given uh, some examples in the appendix for you. Um, Orwin argues that quota moriosity offers an explanation for patterns of partial prefixing reduplication in adjectives and adjectival participles. Um, however, uh, in order to account for those facts alongside the tone facts, or one has to um, uh, lose that mora uh, by rule before high tone assignments. So he had to say that um, codas vacate their moras before tone assignment. So um, if we return to the original controversy, if the analyses uh, that are correct, then it's really only relative to high tone assignment that code is seen not to account. So this is a blanket claim that Said has made in his grammar that um, closed syllables pattern with other light syllables simply doesn't hold. In fact, uh, this seems only to hold in the case of tone. Um, uh, looking to Orwin at all, um, their suggestion that, that uh, Somali consonants may be Baraic seems to be confirmed, but uh, they would appear to retain their moriosity rather than losing them before high tone assignment. However, what we would have to admit into the theory is that different phenomena can uh, count uh, mores of different types. So as I uh, mentioned uh, in the introductions, this runs counter to the Moraic uniqueness hypothesis and related assumptions that um, a given language will display so-called uniform weight um, throughout its phonology. Um, so I would argue that Somali can be um, added to a growing list of languages exhibiting these so-called Moraic mismatches. Um, this has been discussed on a, a number of uh, instances, Crowhurst analysis, uh, analysis of tuba tula ball, hymens of several uh, Bantu languages, uh, stereotas of different varieties of Greek, and then uh, Gordon talks about this in a cross-linguistic survey. Um, in this way, um, Somali uh, counts um, mores of different types, consonantal versus vocalic for different processes, and these actually form natural classes. Uh, consonantal moras are counted for segmental phenomena, but appear to be ignored in the case of supersegmental processes, such as uh, in the assignment of high tone. And what's really interesting and nicely behaved of Somali uh, is that this is in, in line with Gordon 2004, who, and Gordon argues that weight is a function of process rather than a language specific parameter. And more specifically, he says that stress and tone systems respect different criteria of weight because of differences found in their phonetic uh, implementation. And so we can see that Somali aligns in, in that way. We um, arguably have minimality, and um, syllable of shape distribution of phonotactics on the, on the segmental side counting consonants and then on the tone side counting vocalic mores. Um, so 
what we've seen uh, thus far, uh, I believe, is Hyman's methodological cycle in full rotation. Um, conflicting descriptions in, in the literature, um, informed by advances in Mariaic theory and weight typology, provide a new way to analyze and describe Somali former tactics, and, and uh, among other uh, aspects of the language. Um, by cataloging and describing these patterns, in turn, uh, we've seen that um, these patterns offer insight into debates concerning the modeling and representation of geminates, among other aspects of Moraic theory, such as uh, challenges to the Moraic uniqueness hypothesis and uh, support for uh, Gordon's uh, point of view on uh, a process uh, approach to, to weight. Um, from a standpoint of typology, uh, this work shows the, uh, the first evidence of Moraic mismatches in Cushitic, to my knowledge. And um, if we have time, which I think we at least have a few minutes, uh, we could maybe go truly full circle by considering the insights that these outcomes have for another conflict in the literature, and that's metrification. Um, so let me just show you really quickly here. Uh, one of the most uh, hotly debated topics in Somali is, uh, is vowel zero alternations that occur upon some instances of affixation. And um, as you might imagine, uh, some uh, individuals uh, have attributed these alternations to vowel loss and others to appendicis. And so you can see a list here of uh, obviously a number of studies over the years. And so one of the questions is, which analysis has more explanatory power? Um, and, and can Somali's Moraic phonology provide any insight into the matter? And so I have to start somewhere. So I'm going to tentatively assume reduction for reasons that I hope become clear uh, as, as we talk through this. So one of the things about vowels your alternation uh, is that it's triggered by suffixation and not cliticization. Um, so there are some fairly straightforward um, outcomes and nouns So here in 14. Um, we see that uh, ilig plus o, which is the plural, we get ilko, galab plus o, galbo. However, uh, in the so-called subject marker clitic, we get galabi, but not galbi. So there's a, a connection between the type of, um, of operation, morphological operation that occurs. Um, and, and the outcome. Same thing for the definite determiner, argued to be a clitic, we get guriga and not gurga. Um, but this is, uh, you know, widespread uh, different word shapes. Um, reductions are more complicated in verbs, but only because of their greater morphological complexities. So I've given you kind of a, a morphological breakdown here, and we see that we get uh, I've underlined uh, the vowel that is reduced in all of these instances here. So a bunch of different shapes. Um, I also show some alternatives that we don't get that we might expect. So um, I'm trying to go through this quickly. So I'll, I'll kind of cut to the chase here. Um, one way to unify these outcomes is to propose that Somali parses feet and more specifically, quantity sensitive bimeraic trochaic feet from left to right. And so I've um, illustrated what these might look like. Um, uh, so parsing uh, you know, heavy syllables first and then parsing the rest left to right. And you can see here that in, uh, in these instances, it is always the, um, either the uh, second vowel of a foot or otherwise what would end up being an unfooted vowel that is subject to deletion. Um, unless, of course, it is um, pr prevented by unfavorable phonotactics, such as three heavy syllables in a row or uh, a, a tri-consonantal tri -consonantal sequence. Um, but interestingly, in all of these instances, bimeric feet are, appear to be the preferred result. So uh, I know that's very quick to go through, but uh, what I hope to illustrate here is that if this is correct, um, we can say that vowel zero alternations are the result of metrification and their outcomes are governed by phonotactic constraints that are once again, sensitive to consonantal moras. And so this would once again, align with the generalization above that segmental processes in Somali seem to reference uh, consonantal moras. Um, and, and so I'd be you know, perfectly happy to uh, discuss challenges faced by the alternative approach um, in the Q&A. But um, thanks very much. Looking forward to your questions. Thank you.
Thank you, Chris. Exactly yeah. 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very nice. <laughs> Thank you for that. So if you have any uh, questions or comments, please send me your name and affiliation. Yeah, so Paris from uh, ICU has a question. Paris, I'll mute you. Can you hear me? Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had sort of two questions and I think they're related. Um, and I'm sorry if I'm a little ignorant on the subject, but I'll ask them anyway. <laughs> uh, I was wondering if you can maybe go back to where you have uh, figures uh, 12, 10, 13 around that area. Yep. So you said um, that if geminates uh, are heavy, figures, yeah. yeah, if, if, if uh, actually maybe if you scroll up a little bit. Uh, is this 12? Oh, that's 13. In, t in 12, I think it's the Geminids, isn't it? Yeah. So yes. the, the, if I recall correctly, it was if, if Geminids are uh, he heavy in instances like this, why is it not the case that uh, the ones in 10, which are not Geminids, but uh, have the similar syllable structure are not heavy? Um, is that right. the case? Sorry, can you look at 10? Yeah. Yeah, of course, of course. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so these, yes, yeah, so these actually the ones with a short vowel um, are not problematic. So that's that's part of what's interesting here is word internal CVCs with with single tens in ten, CVVs um, of various mm -hmm. types in eleven, but then CV geminates are all totally fine. They occur widely in the language, and so everything seems to be behaving nicely in those instances, but it's when we get these um, uh, word, inter uh, word internal uh -huh. long vowel syllables that things get different. And so the question is here, CVV C singleton versus CVV geminate, um, we wouldn't normally expect geminates to be allowed to the exception of singletons. Um, and mm -hmm. so that's part of what, what's puzzling about this. And so, um, you know, yeah, does this um, does this disrupt sort of the uh, the I guess the mm, the requirements for footedness or for more account that you see in in practice, or do, is this somehow neutralized so that you get the proper uh, weight that you need? Yeah, I mean that's a it's a, a fantastic question. So yeah, how how does this count for the footing? These uh you know would be presumably these these types of word shapes would be uh you know they would have two two feet essentially, right? And so that's another um, argument here in in favor of that you know idea of quantity sensitivity and the fact that these seem to not be um, behaving as um, as 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 uh, moraic. The geminates mm -hmm. are are behaving as moraic. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, can, sorry to keep going, but can I ask another maybe kind of out there question? <laughs> sure. Um, do, do you see any difference between, say, um, like uh, plosives versus, I don't know, uh, uh, continuance or whatnot in, in one length timing and also maybe um, how mores are distributed between them, or do they generally function similarly? Yeah, that's actually a really um, interesting question. So um, there's work that has been done on um, poetic the poetic metrics that Martin Orwin has done. So um, most of the uh, kind of uh, phonology and phonetics work that was done prior to the past couple of years uh, was done by Orwin and his colleagues. and there are a couple of fricatives that um, seem to pattern longer um, than other consonants. Um, F, S, Sh, N, uh, the voiceless velar fricative, I think, are the four that, that do that. Yeah, and so there's some restrictions on where they can occur in the poetic scansion and the other ones that uh, seem to be avoided are ta and ka 
and those are well known to be aspirated. And so there's um, uh, some discussion that's, that's happened among the Somalis that, you know, maybe, uh, you know, it's, it's something to do, you know, because there's the aspiration involved in the T and K, that there's some connection to the, the fricative in terms of you know, that type of structure. So yeah, there are some different differences in, in, in how the fricatives pattern for sure. Okay, I don't thank know you. much about them other than that they're there, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Next, yeah, thank you. Uh, next question comes from Lisa. Yeah. Hey, Chris, thank you for that. Um, I have a, a question. I have a factoid that I came across in Yip about Somali, which uh -huh. is that um, according to Yip, Somali shows the same kind of retraction that you get in Serbian. So speaking of making a uh, connections across languages. Um, so according to Yip anyway, you if a word that has a high tone on a final syllable is in phrase final position, that high tone moves back um, one syllable. So I was wondering if, if you've come across that, if you could confirm that factoid. And then um, in relation to your talk, is that really true that it moves back a syllable or is it maybe a mora and um, could you comment on what might be going on with that? Yeah, I know exactly uh, what you're talking about. There are some uh, two sets of words there. They end in O and A, the mid vowels, and they um, behave a little bit funny and kind of having their high tone shift. Um, so th the way that I have viewed these, and I believe John Saeed views these as, um, uh, historically they have um the, the, those um, suffixes have been uh, reanalyzed relexicalized into the stem and so you have these words that are behaving tonally like um monosl or um monomorphemic words but they're mm. structurally bimorphemic and so what ends up happening is uh in isolation let's say you get penultimate high, which is the predominant pattern in the language. But when you take away the um, uh, finality position, or so you add a suffix or something like that, the high will shift rightward to maintain oh. that penultimate high. Yeah, so it's, it's actually um, the opposite. Yeah, yes. Um, there are a few little tricky things that Somali does that um, uh, I, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily <laughs> agree with uh, uh, as they've been written in the literature, but that's the case of those, uh, those particular words, they involve um, two suffixes. But otherwise, mm -hmm. um, the language is fairly well behaved. Um, it does uh, have high tones uh, are attracted rightward um, as you continue to uh, add suffixes um, mm -hmm. in, in fa fairly fairly usual kind of dominant uh, effects that happens that way. Yeah. Sorry, I, have I did. To. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I, I liked it because it was like, oh, it's just like Serbian, and now my illusion is shattered. I know. I'm like... sorry. <laughs> I mean, there's oh, well. also. There's also the case, one of the other things that, you know, Somali is said to do, and I think it's in uh, Juliet Blevins' uh, work about Somali bucks the trend of uh, final devoicing by final voicing, and it's actually not quite the case because it's actually final de-aspiration is what mm. occurred rather than final devo devoicing. And the orthography plays tricks on everybody because it looks like you're getting T alternating to D, for example, but it's... Mm really just a loss in aspiration. <laughs> the dangers Thanks. of orthography, as I always tell my students. <laughs> right, right. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Shigeto Kawara, Keio University. Yeah, so while we are on this page, I was wondering if we could derive this difference between CVVC and CVVG in terms of possible differences in compression effects of non-geminate consonants and geminate consonants. So if geminates do not shorten the preceding vowels, the contrast between the short and long vowel, that, that won't be endangered. Whereas if like hetero, hetero uh, well, the CVVC, that, that non-geminate consonants do shorten the preceding vowels, then that would endanger a short, long, 
vocalic contrast, and that could explain the difference between the two types of oh, yeah. patterns. Yep. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, um, I'll have to take a look at that. Um, I have not uh, done uh, some finer grain um, phonetic work like that, but it's definitely something that I uh, would like to get to for sure. Um, I've been talking with, uh, so I mentioned Sabrina and David's work. Um, they have been working uh, on uh, the singleton versus geminate patterning uh, as it relates to lenition, intervocal lenition. So I, I'll, I'll have to ask them to see if that's something that they um, have observed. Yeah, it's not that hard to test, right? You just have to look at the CV, CVC or CVG context and see what these constants do to the preceding vowel. Right, absolutely, absolutely. Thanks for the suggestion, I appreciate it. Sure, thank you for the talk. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, we will continue the discussion uh, after uh, officially wrapping up. Uh, so this was uh, the last uh, talk in the ICU linguistic series for the spring. Um, and uh, I would like to uh, thank the co-hosts of this series, uh, Professor Tomoyuki Yoshida and Professor Yoko Mizuta. And we had two excellent assistants who have been helping, uh, who have been great help, uh, Yuki Baldoria and Miyu Izaka. And uh, the Liaison Institute of System Missionary Suzuki uh, took care of uh, uh, related work at the IRS side. This event was supported by the shared budget of the ICU Research Institutes and Institute for Education Research and Service and the Linguistic Lab at ICU. Uh, at the moment, uh, we know that uh, in the fall uh, and throughout the winter, we will have a new uh, colloquium series with a specific theme, actually. Uh, we are gonna uh, invite some uh, professors uh, who work on the African linguistics. Uh, so uh, please stay tuned uh, uh, with uh, uh, further information related to them. Uh, thank you all and uh, let's stop the recording.